That was cool. Yeah, baby! Woohoo! Hi, and welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer, and in this episode, we're gonna explore the world of subsurface fishing for trout. Now, you know, people say that trout feed 90% of the time underwater, and that may be true. The problem is, we don't usually know what they're eating. So there's a lot of mystery involved, a lot of trial and error. Join us, and we'll show you some tips on subsurface fishing for trout. Oh, you got him. <laughs> oh, wow. Yay! I know, you're so tame when you've been caught. Because this is the way you cast. This show has been brought to you by... Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet. 150 years ago, trout fishing was done solely with what today we would call traditional winged wet flies. Anglers fished as many as 10 of them on a single leader and even cast them over rising fish with success. Then people began experimenting with floating flies a little over 100 years ago, and this concentration on more exacting imitations of insects and crustaceans gave rise to the nymph, really just another kind of wet fly, but usually without wings. Today we fish wet flies and nymphs interchangeably, but wet flies are more often swung in the current than fish dead drift. Fishing a wet fly or nymph on the swing, in other words, across and downstream on a tight line, is both a return to a more traditional way of fishing with a fly and a relaxing and elegant way to fish. One of the really pleasant things about, uh, about fishing a wet fly is that they don't have any air resistance at all. And so they don't have as much air resistance as a dry. And unlike most nymph fishing, you don't have an indicator weight on the leader. So the casting is just really easy and pleasant. Because trout often take the fly on a tight line, the strike is felt immediately and fish often hook themselves. It's also a great way to cover a lot of water when you're not sure where the fish are. This kind of fishing, a sunken fly, works best in shallow water with a gentle riffle, and it's tougher with conflicting currents and in very deep water. Wet fly fishing is also most productive when you see the occasional rise. I'm just letting that, I don't even really have to make a mend in this nice slow water. I can just let that fly. Oh, there's one. Oh, we lost him. Don't even need to mend. This water is so nice and gentle and uniform. I can just let that fly swing across the current. Although most of the time when you fish nymphs, you strive to eliminate drag on the fly. When swinging a wet fly, the drag is subtle and controlled. Some aquatic insects can swim. A swung wet fly could imitate a tiny bait fish, or it might also imitate an aquatic insect rising to the surface to hatch. We don't know exactly why fish take a swung wet fly, but that's part of the fun and the mystery of fishing this way. Frequent mends keep the fly from swinging too quickly because a tiny insect can't swim that fast against the current. So the slower your fly swings, the better. Keeping the rod tip relatively high also helps to keep the fly's swing more moderate. One more scientific way of fishing a wet fly on the swing is called the Lysen ring lift or induced take. Here, you cast the fly slightly upstream and across, make some mends, follow the line through its drift with the rod tip, and when you think the fly is close to where a fish should be, stop moving the rod tip or lift it slightly. The fly will suddenly rise toward the surface, and often it encourages savage strikes from the trout. Before we move on to the more complicated issue of fishing nymphs, let's visit Pete Kutzer for some helpful tips on casting with a strike indicator and weight on your leader. Through all these presentations, I've been talking about staying in the straightest line possible. We want to stay in that nice, tight, straight path. That's going to keep that loop nice and tight. 
When you're dealing with heavy flies or wind resistant flies or great big poppers, or uh, maybe you have an indicator rig with a lot of weight on that, uh, on the end of that leader, that's when we might want to actually start to travel in a little bit of an arch. That's going to help open up those loops and prevent that heavy fly or that big popper from colliding with the rod. I have seen rods break just by a piece of split shot coming forward. So we want to open up that loop by traveling in a little bit of an arch. That's going to help get that fly still out to those fish, but keep that fly well away from that rod and away from that line. Another great way to cast nymphs and wet flies is called the water load, where you let the river be your back cast. Sometimes, if you've got a lot of wind, if you've got a lot of brush, you got two flies and an indicator and weight on your leader, and you don't want to be casting all over the place, you can do what's called a water load. What you do, it's very simple, you wait until the line drags behind you, you pick up the rod tip and flick a cast forward. So you keep doing that. As soon as the line drags behind you, especially with nymph fishing, you don't need to be that, that super delicate. Just pick it up and make a forward cast. That way you don't have to have your line going back and forth in the air and your flies tangling and getting in trees and things like that. You know, it's not all about catching giant fish. Sometimes just swinging a wet fly through a riffle and catching small trout is a lot of fun. Doesn't always have to be a monster. As you can see, even this little rainbow is bending that six weight rod. Nymphing is one of the most effective ways to catch trout day in and day out. It works all day long, whether trout are rising or not, and in all kinds of water. Feeding trout seldom pass up a well-presented nymph and will accept these flies more readily than dries or streamers in most cases. Artificial nymphs can imitate the larvae of mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, midges, and also freshwater crustaceans like scuds, crayfish, and even aquatic worms. But the method of presenting all these imitations is the same. What fly do you tie on? Most people think that trout are not as selective when feeding under the surface, and you might want to pick a nymph that's popular in the area or one that a guide told you about. But in an unfamiliar stream with no other help, we can get an educated guess by looking at submerged rocks and along the edges of rivers. So one thing you can do when you're nymph fishing, the obvious thing, is to turn over some rocks and see what's on the bottom. Here we've got these brachycentris, I think. Anyways, they're caddisflies, they're case caddisflies. I think they're brachycentris. We don't need to know the Latin name. So you turn over a rock and you try to see what's in the river and then you try to match that with the closest thing in your box. All you know is what's there in the water. It's a clue and it's a start, but not knowing exactly what the fish you're taking, you're at a disadvantage. And that's why fishing with a wet fly or a nymph is so exciting, mysterious, and interesting. One of the biggest issues when fishing a nymph is getting the fly deep enough when trout are feeding close to the bottom. At the same time, letting the fly dead drift without showing any pull from the line or leader. Current is always faster near the surface than near the bottom. So when line and leader land on the water, they immediately exert pull on the fly unless you remedy the situation with your presentation. As a result, even though we think we're fishing a fly close to the bottom with a dead drift, it's not often the case. And most aquatic insects and crustaceans, when they drift, don't swim or are at best feeble swimmers. So trout often shy away from a fly that's dragging but it's hard to see drag when your fly is underwater. You can often tell if a fish takes your nymph by watching the tip of your floating line or by watching your leader. If it hesitates or dips under suddenly, you've either hung bottom or a fish has taken your fly. But strikes can be quite subtle, and fish can take and reject or spit out your fly very quickly. And unless a fish takes your fly in fast water or very aggressively, many strikes go unnoticed. Just as with any other kind of nymph fishing, any time that floating line hesitates, wiggles, twitches, does anything, 
that looks weird, it looks suspicious, set the hook immediately. With nymph fishing, those fish are gonna take that fly and spit it out really quickly, and you gotta set the hook quickly. That doesn't mean wrench it way over your head and break the tippet, but you gotta be quick and just about this much. Just like you're gonna make another cast, but do it quickly. So to help stack the odds in our favor, we use strike indicators. These are little more than tiny bobbers. In fact, I once fished with a nymph a whole day on the North Platte River in Wyoming with one of those big plastic bait bobbers. I bought it in a gas station. It was a little clunky, but it worked. Strike indicators turned nymph fishing from something that was almost a black art into one of the easiest ways to catch trout on a fly. In fact, nymph fishing with a strike indicator is a lot like fishing a worm with a bobber and some of the deadliest nymph anglers are those who started out fishing worms for trout. It's not that different, except the fish spit out your offering faster. Indicators come in all different colors and sizes and types, and most people carry a variety of them. Different colors show up better under different light conditions, so you should experiment. Also, carry a range of sizes. The indicator should be big enough to hold your fly and weight off the bottom, but not so big that it spooks the fish. Most people these days use a big uh, plastic or cork strike indicator. They're really buoyant, they float all day long, um, but they do land kind of hard, and there's sometimes when you want something more subtle. That's a time when you want to use a yarn indicator. Yarn indicators on flat water like this are very subtle. They don't land with a lot of uh, commotion, and you can really see the slightest twitch in a yarn indicator, so they're one of the best things to use on flat water like this. Indicators serve another very important purpose. Besides being strike indicators, they're drift indicators. You can't tell if your fly is dragging underwater, but you can watch your indicator, and if it begins to struggle against the current, you know the fly is dragging and that you need to mend line. If you watch your indicator and make sure that it's traveling at the same speed as the bubbles or debris in the current, you can be pretty sure you're getting a drag-free drift. If it's not drifting properly, mend the line to adjust your drift or use a reach cast the next time you present the fly. Exactly where to put your indicator on the leader is part trial and error based on how often the fly ticks bottom. Okay, when you put an indicator on your leader, general rule of thumb is to have the indicator about one and a half times the water depth. You want that fly to be riding just above the bottom and the fly is never seldom gonna hang directly below the indicator. So you wanna estimate the water depth, and then the water's pretty shallow here. I think it's about, you know, it's about this deep, so I'm gonna go right about here with my indicator. And I'm just going to put the indicator on my leader here. This is the kind of foam kind, it's got rubber bands inside. You just twist it a few times and that holds it wherever you want it, yet when you change water depths, when you go to another place, you can slide that indicator and move it to wherever you want. This is only a general guideline though, so play with the strike indicator's position until you either tick bottom once in a while or you catch a fish. Despite our best efforts, even with a weighted fly and weight on the leader, the fly may not get deep enough or may not drift in a realistic manner. So we have to combine some presentation techniques and perhaps add more weight to the leader. Let's discuss presentation first. One way is to cast straight upstream so that your fly and weight and indicator are all in the same current lane. But that's a lot of work. You have to gather line quickly and you risk putting your fly line right on top of the fish. It's best for short casts. When fishing across the current, you can also mend line, sometimes frequently throughout a drift. But mending often moves the fly too much, and it's better to get that upstream loop of line before the fly hits the water with a reach cast. Keep trying different approaches until you find something that works. When you're faced with a deeper run and you're fishing smaller flies like we are today, you need some weight on your leader. Nobody likes to put weight on the leader. It makes casting tougher and you get hung up more often, but sometimes you gotta do it to get your fly down to the fish. So what I'm gonna do now is put on one shot. You try to start with as little weight as possible and then you add, you add, you add the lightest weight first and then you add weight to the leader until you're ticking bottom 
every half a dozen casts or so. Your fly's got to be occasionally ticking bottom where you're just not fishing deep enough. The thing you want to do, you don't want to try to put these on with your teeth because they're hard. You need a pair of forceps. And I've got a knot above my, I've got a knot above my first fly. It's about uh, a foot above my first fly. And I'm going to attach the shot right above that knot. Shot tends to slide on your leader, so you really want to put it above a knot. Rigging a nymph with weight is not an exact science, so experiment with various arrangements until you catch fish. It's really satisfying when you figure it out. Now most people fish nymphs with indicators. It's easier, it's better in conflicting currents, and usually they fish two flies under an indicator. You wouldn't think so, but trout are just as likely to take the upper fly with a piece of tippet sticking out of both ends as they are the lower fly. The section of tippet between the two flies can be anywhere from six to 20 inches long, but the longer that piece, the more cumbersome the whole arrangement gets, and a typical separation between the two flies is about eight inches. The tippet section between the two flies can be the same size as the upper tippet or a smaller diameter, especially if the lower fly is a lot smaller than the upper fly. Now that you know about rigging nymphs and some basic presentation, it's time to learn more about how to present them. Fishing with an indicator is sometimes called long line nymphing, and it's the best way when you can't get close to the fish. But if you can, it's always better to cast as close to the fish as you can without spooking them. This is called high sticking. One way to fish nymphs is with what's called short line nymphing, and it's done very close to you. It's done almost under your rod tip. You want the fly line to stay out of the water if possible. You use heavily weighted flies and or some weight on your leader. You lob them upstream and you just follow the nymphs down through the current like this. You can high stick nymph with or without an indicator. If you do with an indicator, it's sometimes easier, especially when you got wind blowing like, like we do today. It's very difficult to see that leader twitching because you got the wind blowing your leader downstream. So sometimes a strike indicator helps a lot. And there you just keep the line above your strike indicator and just follow the strike indicator down through the current. Strikes and high stick nymphing are gonna be fairly subtle. You'll just see that leader twitch upstream or tighten and it's either bottom or a fish. So the minute you see that leader dart a little bit or move a little bit or do something that looks wrong or doesn't look like the other cast, set the hook quickly. There are times when you won't be able to high stick nymph. High stick nymphing is really effective because you have that dead drift right in front of you. It's really easy to follow the flies down through the current seam. But when you have to cast longer to get across a piece of water like this, then you have to cast your indicator upstream and across, or across, or a little bit downstream, but make a quick mend right after the indicator hits. As your indicator goes down through the current, sometimes you're gonna have to mend once, twice, even three times. Try not to move the indicator when you mend. Just flip enough line to get that line upstream of the indicator. Toward the end of your drift, just before drag sets in, you can also release some slack line to make that indicator float even further downstream, dead drift. Just have some extra line in your hand, some slack line, and flip that slack line into the current. Sometimes when you're nymphing, just a little change in position will really make the difference in whether you catch fish or not. You may want to move upstream a few feet. You may want to move out a little, move downstream. Uh, sometimes even fishing that same pocket, just a little bit of a change in position might get your flies in there just right. One of the most exciting things in nymph fishing is sight casting to a fish that's feeding in shallow water with a nymph, a naked nymph, which means no weight on the leader, no indicator, just a tiny weighted nymph thrown to a fish in shallow water. You watch the fish's reactions or you watch your leader to see the strike. That was cool. Wow. That's a big fish. And I'm probably not gonna get him out of there. Well, maybe. 
Maybe, 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 maybe. Oh, I got lucky on that one. All right, you ready, Patrick? Yep. Nice thing about fishing without an indicator is you can reel the fish right up close to your rod. Yeah, baby! Woohoo! Bring them out in the sun here. Get them in the clear water. Burp them a little bit like they do the salmon. They roll, they, they uh, roll them on the belly and get all the air out of them. There he goes. At the other end of the scale from sight fishing nymphs is fishing them from a drift boat. It's one of the easiest ways to catch trout. In fact, some people think it's too easy. With an experienced guide at the oars, by casting about 45 degrees in front of the boat, you can get long, drag-free floats as the guide works to keep the boat drifting at the same speed as the indicator. But you still have to do your part and mend the line periodically. I joined experienced guide Molly Seminick in Montana to learn more about proper positioning and drift of indicators when nymphing from a boat. When the person in the front, in the bow, casts downstream and their float, the boat catches up to the fly and the, the fly gets to the oar, then they pick up and recast downstream. If you like to catch lots of fish in a day, there is probably nothing as productive as fishing nymphs from a drift boat Rainbow! because you can cover so much water and the trout are always eating below the surface. No matter what kind of water you like to fish, from brawling rivers to tiny mountain streams, nymph fishing will often save the day and it's really not that hard. Fishing with a subsurface fly and moving water adds a lot of mystery to fishing. You never really know what trout are eating down there, but striking to an unseen fish and suddenly feeling the weight of a hefty trout is a thrill that never gets old. To learn more about wet flies and nymphing, go to the Orvis Learning Center at orvis.com learn for more information. Thanks for watching. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle, Ontario yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet.